Welcome to another episode of the CC Podcast Conversations, where inspiring Christians share their faith-filled stories. Please take a moment to subscribe to this podcast, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. This helps push our content to a broader audience. Are you new to listening? Check out our other podcasts. First, the CC Podcast Daily Dose Devotions, where we're walking through the Bible, focusing on short clips of Scripture. Second is the CC Broadcast, where our weekly radio programming is archived. These podcasts are available wherever you're listening or at christiancrusaders.org. Okay, let's get started with today's episode. Here's our host, Matt Reister, the Executive Director of Christian Crusaders. Hey, Andrew, what's up? Hey, Matt, how's it going? Andrew is our technical director, and we have him on here with me to do kind of a little bit of a sidekick chat before we get into our interview, something we learned at the National Religious Broadcasters Convention last year, trying to pick up on any good tips we can get on. Andrew was just telling me when we were getting the mics warmed up about Mission Impossible and then testing mics with the word toast. I don't remember that. Yeah, yeah, I, that's one of the only parts I remember about that. I, I went back and watched it, and, and it was hilarious because they treat the internet like like it's some weird thing, and they type in Book of Job, and it gets like 200 search results. <laughs> uh, but <laughs> What the, year was that movie? Like 1991 or something like that, 93 maybe. But yeah, I remember, toast, toast, toast. <laughs> that was how they checked their mics. So today we're going to have an interview with Ike and Tim Butker. Several things that are interesting about that. First of all, Tim is our new associate preacher at Christian Crusaders Radio and Internet Ministry. We're an 85-year-old ministry. We do a weekly radio broadcast that includes some music and some preaching, and Tim has just come on board to do our last Sunday of the month. Tim has a son, Ike, and Ike played football in Cedar Falls and basketball, Cedar Falls, Iowa. Went on to the University of Iowa. Remarkable story that comes out in the interview about how he was noticed by Iowa and then offered a scholarship had a great career at Iowa. Now he's playing for the Buffalo Bills at, as at, at the time that we're recording this. But uh, it was a great interview. Yeah. And we, we titled it God's Hand on an NFL Player's Journey. And I just think there are so many points in this story where it just doesn't happen unless the Lord's just willing it to happen. Right, yeah. And I think, I think people are going to really appreciate just sort of the uniqueness of this story. You know, you hear um, – you hear about a lot of people, a lot of uh, you know kids who go on to to you know grow up through youth sports and go on to play uh, professionally, uh, whose parents are you know on them twenty four seven and have have them in uh, you know youth sport activities and all this different stuff, um, and that's just it's, it's a nice contrast to hear kind of how how Ike's story played out, um, you know with with his parents and. He was involved in some of that stuff, but there just wasn't the crazy pressure. I, right. We're going to do a podcast about this sometime, probably Tim and I and anyone else who wants to chime in on it. But just a conversation, especially for Christian parents. I see so many parents that are like the driving force behind trying to get their kid to be successful at sports because they have some unique identity issue that they need their kid to be successful and just yeah. ruins kids and yeah and it burns them out on the sports that they originally loved and tim and chris didn't do that with ike and right. and you couldn't have schemed ike to the nfl and the lord just made it happen exactly exactly and it's fun to see uh you know from from ike's perspective um you know, not only that journey, but but sort of how the journey is continuing and where it's going to go from here, and just hear him talk about it, um, it's, it's inspiring. It's 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 really it's it's really interesting, really entertaining, but but it's inspiring too. I could see us have another conversation with Ike someday down the road, just kind of update us on how it's been. Yep. So uh, I know that there might be some new people checking this out. I host a podcast called the Fry Bus Podcast. You can look that up. It's not a Christian ministry podcast per se. It has to do with a bus that we got and turned into a tailgating bus. We do some interviews in it with former Iowa Hawkeye players and coaches who knew or played for or coached with Hayden Fry. But we have promoted this Ike Butker interview on the CC podcast over there. So if you're one of the people that heard that and are joining us today because you heard it there, welcome to the CC podcast. Yeah. What, what else would you tell those folks? I, I just say, but you know, be sure to check out all of our podcasts. Um, you know, we we I think that we have a great variety here. Um, being able to listen to, to interviews like the one you're going to hear today with Ike, we've got 
uh, just a whole bunch of other ones. Uh, at the time of recording, we're up to 18 or 19 um, different conversations like this. Uh, but then also the ability to hear, uh, you know, weekly broadcasts. Uh, the one that the, the broadcast that we put out over the radio, we also uh, make into a podcast. And, uh, and then we do the Daily Dose Devotion as well that uh, the Matt, you host. And uh, just a, a great way to, to dive into scripture, especially if you're unfamiliar with, with, with the Bible and just kind of want to um, figure out, you know, in, in, you know, manageable pieces, you know, five to eight minute pieces uh, where we talk about how the Bible impacts your daily life and, and how it's relevant today. Um, you know, it's, it's a really uh, great thing to check out. You might recognize Andrew's voice from over there as well, because he's doing some production for us on the Frybus podcast and yep. some announcing. So, hey, thanks for tuning in and enjoy this interview with Ike and Tim Butker. All right. Hey, everybody. Uh, this is Matt Reeser with the CC Podcast. And I've got another uh, studio full of uh, coolness with, with you today, and we're going to tell another great story. I've got uh, Tim Butker and his son, Ike, Isaac. You go by Ike most of the time now, right? Yeah, Ike. Yeah. Or, uh, and he goes by Diesel. Diesel. <laughs> where, where did Diesel come from? <laughs> Just got cooked up, and it's really rolling now. How long have you been calling him Diesel? <laughs> A couple of years. <laughs> yeah, most people he knows calling me Diesel now. Oh, that's good. That's good. Um, Ike, I've I've known you since you were just a little guy. Uh, some of my first memories of Ike. So actually, I should probably back up and tell how I know Tim, uh, your dad. Um, way back when I was in junior high, I went to Okoboji Bible Camp, and Tim was one of the counselors there, unbeknownst to me at the time. Like, he's one of the coolest guys there, of course. And everyone wants to hang out with Tim Butker. Tim Butker. Nate Carlson was one of the other ones. Remember Nate? Yep. And uh, there were some others. But uh, I was never in Tim's cabin, but he was the – we had this thing up at Okoboji on the lake called Water Olympics during camp. And you would go out and compete. Do you remember this, Tim? Yep. There was all these obstacles and challenges, and you'd running go out. out. Running back in, carrying things. And Tim was just – everyone called him Rhino up there. And I don't know if it's because he was as strong as a rhino or what, but Tim just took like six or eight of us boys that were on this team and was just dragging us out to like, we're winning every challenge because it just got climb on Tim and he goes and wins the challenge for us. And uh, you guys ended up running the camp for a while or helping out with programming. Yep. You and Chris yep. after you got married. Got married there. Yep. And then uh, college came around for me and Tim, you were at Orchard Hill Church yep. doing some college Cedar ministry Falls, Yeah. and uh, your dad led a Bible study I was in. Did you know that? Uh, yeah, I think you told me that before. Yeah, yeah there's wow. a group of some guys in a house that we lived in, six or eight guys. Called the house, the promised land. The promise, you remember that? Mm -hmm. That's good. And then uh, after college, I started doing college ministry myself at another local church that partners with the church Tim was at. And so uh, we were part of that together. There was a ministry on campus called Basic, Brothers mm -hmm. and Sisters in Christ, that was really started... Um, around the time I was starting college and around the time you were starting at Orchard Hill. Yeah, Jim Luby and I started it. That's right. Yep. Uh, I remember Jane Hoke saying. Yep, Jane was uh, involved. And the Bremners. Yep. And and so BASIC turned into this large group uh, Christian worship event on campus. At its peak, I think there were like seven or 800 kids coming every Thursday night. Tim was one of our main speakers. And, uh, and so Ike, that's when Ike comes around, and uh, what year were you born? 94. 94. So that was my freshman year. What, your birthday's in October sometime? Yeah, October. And uh, so that's right when I'm starting college. And Ike was kind of like the mascot of BASIC. Mm -hmm. I remember, Came to all, everything. <laughs> yeah. Carried in, first of all, and then... And then running around. Yeah. And it must have been about the time uh, you were three or four or something. I specifically remember in Lang Hall is where we had it yep. at that time. yep. And there was this story that we had heard, maybe at Bible study with Tim or something like that, like the chickens, you had some chickens on the farm, and a fox or some coons or something like that got in the hen house and tore some chickens up. And I think you told us that in another spot. And so we get there on Thursday night, and Ike's running around like, Ike, dude, I heard your chickens got dominated. Like, are you doing all right? And, you know, we're thinking this kid's going to start crying or something like that. He's like, no, it was awesome. He has this wild look in his face like... Oh, no, it was cool. There's blood everywhere, whatever it was. <laughs> so anyway, that's Ike and Tim. Now now uh, things have evolved, and, and Tim, you're leading uh, the the chaplains over at the Western Home Communities. Mm -hmm. Yep. 
the lead preacher at uh, Fresh Wind Worship, which is going really well. We get a chance to come over there. And so it, it's kind of evolved all the way from a kid at camp uh, under a counselor to a, a college kid under a Bible study leader, and now uh, just you know, good friends and partners in ministry. Mm-hmm. I appreciate that. Yes. So I do too, Matt. It's been good. And it, it's, it's been so exciting. Um, you know, being as close to you as we've been to just watch this whole story with Ike. Uh, and so we'll kind of spoil the story, not that anyone doesn't know, but Ike, you're playing in the NFL right now yeah. uh, with the Buffalo Bills, yeah. at least right now. Yeah. And um, but, but how you got there is one of my just favorite stories, different steps in it. So we're going to tell some of that today. It's really a God story. I mean, kind of Ike's work and then how God made him and how brought you know how the Lord brought it all together. Yep. So let's go back to those um, even maybe those days at basic when Ike's just a little guy. I mean, did you ever were, were there any signs that that Ike was headed this direction? I mean, really, if you look back, you'd see the signs. At the time, you wouldn't know. I mean, we just actually watched videos the other night of his birth, and when he came out, he was eleven pounds six point six ounces. And the nurse in there, we, we heard this on the video, which I had never heard before. And she said, wow, he's going to be a football player. Now, wow. Right in the birthing room. And then his first uh, word was ball. And it wasn't mom. It wasn't dad. We were waiting on those <laughs> words. But he would play ball all the time. And a lot of it was basketball focused. Yeah. And I mean, so we knew he just loved moving sports, you know, all that stuff. And his size kind of, it, it makes sense when you look back, but when you're a parent, you're just, you're happy the young man's healthy and he's right. coming out strong and, and then you're excited to move from there. Totally. Totally. So Ike, uh, now you've got a sister, Adrian, and actually as an assistant uh, coach over Orlu Christian with the boys and she's with the girls, I've, I've had a chance to interact with her a little bit. And so I've heard some of her evolution into sports, which is a story by itself, mm-hmm. but what do you remember from an early age? Did you, uh, did, just like any boy, love sports, or were there other things you like to do? I know you grew up on an acreage, and there's a lot of room to run chickens and pigs. and. Yeah, I would say sports is always my, my favorite thing to do. Um, basketball always was my favorite thing, but getting called out um, – from the bedroom, like I was getting introduced by dad, <laughs> you know, there's videos of that. I would do that for all day. You know, oh, yeah. if he would let me. You mean like introductions for basketball games? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you would go back in the back bedroom and, and he'd say, call me out. And so, <laughs> so we'd be in the living room. We'd say, ladies and gentlemen, introducing Ike or Isaac Butker. He'd come running out. What you was know? your number? Oh, four, it was 14. When you were getting introduced? Oh, I did. I he didn't have didn't a have any, Matter of yeah. fact, a lot of times he was just in his underwear doing that. <laughs> <laughs> and so then good. he'd run back in and say, "Do it again." <laughs> <laughs> so that was really what I liked. I mean, I like being outside, shooting hoops. Yeah. Um, you know, if it was a nice day, that's what I was doing. But, were you guys always out on that acreage since you were born? Yeah, he had two years in town. Yeah, and then we moved to the acreage right when Adrian was born. Two years, and he was two years old. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the whole time. Yeah. Yep. Tim, you got a little bit of sports background. I mean, a little you... bit. I mean, I not not near what Ike has been and Adrian, and just played in high school and football and basketball and ran track and pole vaulted. And, but one of the things I, you know, when he was growing and you, I could see the sports part of him. I could see how he would, you know, be competitive and like to win. And so then, and this is a, a good little part of our story is, I I offered him some cash to beat his dad when he was younger. In basketball? Yeah. One-on-one. Man. Yeah. And we'd play out. We had a, we had a cement slab, and and I figured, well, you know, I offer him, you know, I, it was $100. I said, you know, if you beat me, $100. And that was to help him be competitive. Mm-hmm. And uh, I didn't think he'd beat me until he was a junior or senior in high school. And I, I think it was when you were a freshman. And he did a step back. It was pretty close. He did a step back shot, hit a long one, and that was my hundred dollars right there as a freshman year. And I thought I can't keep doing this. I get way. Too I was going to say, was that just hundred bucks for one time, one, or each one time he beat you? One win, and then it was supposed to keep going. And I had, so I changed the rules, and the rules turned to if you beat me again, it's five dollars, and then if you beat me again, it's ten, and then if you beat me again, it's fifteen. My whole goal was to get him to fight. 
you know, yeah. and really work hard. And when it got to about 2025, 20, I, I had accomplished my goal. <laughs> <laughs> and I Call said, the, the game is on. over. You're tired. <laughs> Have you guys shared this story before? It sounds like you've shared this before. We've <laughs> laughed about it together. That's, Not really yeah, to other people. No. Uh, uh-uh. That's hilarious. Yeah. But it, but the, the great thing about it was, you know, he fought hard there. And that competitive spirit was evident in him the whole way, just competing. Totally. And God makes some people that way, and some people aren't that competitive. That's right. You know? Now, I know you guys obviously well enough to know um, that, you know, this has been a fun ride. We'll hear more of it unfold. Uh, But when Ike is just a little guy, even when he's first born, I mean, your greatest hope for him is that he would serve the Lord, that he'd know God. Uh, this is a world where it's increasingly difficult. Yeah. I've got four kids of my own, and I'd give anything if I could guarantee that for my kids, regardless of what career they go into, regardless of if they're successful or not. Yeah. Talk about that and just kind of how you and Chris, you know, kind of uh, as your home and your family started, how you kind of set out that direction. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the birthing process is... It's traumatic, and you don't know what's going to happen. And obviously, you know, Ike's getting ready to go through that now with his wife being pregnant. But when he's born, you're just thankful you made it through. You're thankful, you know, you got a healthy child and that God gave you a child. And what you really want is for that child to become all that God created him to be. And so many parents want to kind of push a child one direction or another. And I had a little bit of that in me. But pretty soon the Lord, you know, he had to teach me that he created each person and, and created my son, created my daughter, and what for? And to be seeking God about how to affirm him, how to encourage him, how to build him up. Because we couldn't predict what either one of them was going to do. And a lot of parents try and put their own agenda on their children, but actually they're God's children first, and he's got a plan. Yeah, We want to be seeking that. I want to maybe later on come back to talking about parents' role in uh, a, in an in a kid's life who likes athletics. I've seen that yes. done the wrong way a lot. Mm-hmm. And um, would love to get your take on that. Yep. Uh, before we go down that road, Ike, so you're growing up, you enjoy sports, you love getting introduced out of the bedroom in your underwear. And <laughs> 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 uh, Well, I mean, you said basketball was kind of a big deal. So what, like in the middle of elementary, you start playing like AAU basketball or? Yeah, real early, uh, third or fourth grade. <laughs> we start traveling around playing 30 or 40 games a year on weekends, just in the Midwest, really. And he got recruited with an older team because of his size. So I was always playing a grade up in basketball, AU. And I did that for a while, probably Mm -hmm. three or four years. Um, Did you ever feel like your parents were pushing you into that, or was that you just had an intrinsic desire to go play basketball as much as you could? Yeah, like never felt pushed by my parents to do anything. And I'd say once or twice a year, they would sit me down and say, like, they obviously weren't going to let me quit. They knew I wasn't going to quit anything that I have to do with sports anyway. But they would just say, if you don't want to do this or that, you know, it's not for us. You know, we're not, we love watching you play, but it's not like if you stop playing, we're going to love you any less or you're going to be valued less. Um, and, you know, the eyes of the Lord, if you don't want to, you know, continue doing basketball or, you know, even in college, um, you know, we'll get to that later. But when I would get hurt or something like that, be like, you know, you don't have to do this for us. Yeah. And so I always knew that. And you see, I mean, even when I was growing up, and I know it's probably 10, 20, 100 times worse now. Uh, but parents just caring way more about the sports than, you know, the kids yep. and just wanting. And that's what I'd say, you know, you see where I came from, um, no one would have said, you know, you're going to, your kid's going to play in the NFL. But a lot of parents thought that their kids would and push them harder than they, you know, ever wanted to go. So my drive was always, you know, pretty, pretty much from myself, um, Mm -hmm. that competitive drive. And, you know, dad learned early how to get that out of me and just, uh, I'd say that that's the biggest thing that I learned from, you know, those games back then is flipping the switch. Um, and that's something that, you know, not everybody can't do it. And it took me a while to master it, and I still haven't mastered it yet. But, you know, I talk to people, and they're like, 
well, how, you play football. Like, you you seem like such a nice guy. You're too, like, you're smiling too much. <laughs> and, like, they, people will literally say this to me, and I'm like, yeah, I know, but you've never seen me flip the switch. Yeah. <laughs> and that's just, like, it's a whole different, it's yeah. a mindset that you can put yourself into. And, you know, like I said, I haven't mastered it yet, but the the people that are the best at, I would say, football especially, it's, you know, a very violent game. Uh, they can flip the switch on Sundays or, you know, Saturdays, whatever day it is. Yeah. And they can be a whole different person uh, when you see problems is when they can't. Yep. You know, flip the switch, or they're always one way, yep, or always you know the other way. So, yep. learning that was you know started early for me. That's great stuff. I would just add, you know, as he's sharing that, <clears throat> I think about uh, when he was younger, and I was still not learning my role as a father. And I was he was in this all star basketball team, and, and he didn't have that competitive spirit. He was younger, you know, and just getting going. And I was getting mad at him. And I remember yelling from him from the, at him one time from the stands. And he looked at me like, Dad, I mean, I'm in third grade, <laughs> is what the, what the message kind of said to me. You know? mm-hmm. And I sat back in the bleachers at that game and, and had to just do a check in my spirit and say, as a father, be, a, be his biggest fan mm-hmm. and cheer him on to whatever level of sports he, he goes to. Mm-hmm. And don't make it hard extra. He's already got a coach. Mm-hmm. You know, don't make it harder on him. Mm-hmm. And that was a big switch for me mm-hmm. that moment in third grade. And I'm happy it happened early because I see a lot of high school parents, college parents even now, even there's pro parents who can't get themselves separated from their yeah, son or daughter that's in sports. You know, coaching uh, the high school guys over at Waterloo Christian, my son Mason plays plays JV and like I did in high school, sits on the bench for now uh, on the varsity team. But, um, you know, you see your kid, you want your kid to do well. but And, and sometimes there's that kind of twinge of, right. oh, why'd you throw that? Why, what's that? You've thrown eight turnovers now. Like what's going on here? You know? And so the coach and the dad and me are trying to figure out, but, but I never want to send the message that somehow your value in my eyes is based on your performance on the basketball floor. And and we've had similar conversations with Mason, like Mason, listen, you do not need to play basketball for me. I mean, this is, you don't need to do this for me. However, if you want to, if this is an internal desire you have, then I want to help you do it as well as you can which is different than like you're talking about some of these parents that are mm-hmm. clinging to like yeah. it's their identity. Right. Their identity is based on their own junior high or high school kids performance. It's right. just sick. Right. And you know, some of the things we ran into one, he played baseball for a little while and then we just felt like, Hey, our summers w- will be more family oriented if we have less baseball games. And he said, you know, I think I'm about done with baseball. And we said, Hey, that's great. And then the parents, there were parents that came at us and said, he's too young to make that decision. You have to keep him in baseball. Wow. And I was just like, what in the world? You know, there's so much pressure to, uh, when he was on the all-star basketball team, it must have been fourth or fifth grade. We came home after one tournament, and I literally felt in my spirit, it's time to be done with this all-star basketball stuff. And we just quit. Yep. I mean, he was fine with it. It was near the end of a season. And it's like there's so much pressure if you're going to do this, if you're going to make it here, you're going to make it here, you got to be a part of this, got to be a part of that. Even at his senior year, he was being recruited to play in one of these uh, oh, Shrine traveling, no, oh. traveling basketball teams. Going, going in there. Yeah. Year. And then uh, his head coach, Tom Bardall, called and said, well, what if we just kind of have our team do some summer games? Well, it goes against conventional wisdom for kind of climbing as high as you can and being the best you can. But it was a great summer. I mean, we look back on that summer. It was just one of the best summers we had traveling around. And it didn't affect what God's plan was for Ike at all. So what I, what I, and this is a conversation Jen and I have had too, is like our kids' involvement in sports, we want it to serve a greater goal. Yes. It, the, the goal isn't the sports right. or the performance in itself. We want to serve a kingdom goal ultimately. Yes. And if, if God decides to give a kid 
a platform for the kingdom right. through sports, great. Right. But there's other ways to have kingdom impact than yes. being a great basketball player yeah. in and, junior high. And I would say as a parent, you're watching, is sports being good for our child or is it not? Is it shaping character or is it bringing shame on them? And you got to pay attention to that. You want to help develop your child as a person for their life, not some great athlete that... Totally. You know? This is, uh, we, we could have an entire different podcast about this, and we probably should sometime because I think Christian parents should parent their athletic kids in a way that is noticeably different than the rest of the world. I want to break into the podcast right here quickly and just remind you of the Cedar Falls Bible Conference, which is going to happen this next summer, July 25th through August 1st. And we're going to have a great lineup of speakers, including Tim Butker, who you're listening to on this podcast right now. We'll also have Jay Warner Wallace, Recap Gray from last year, one of our favorites, Steve Kramer, who's the radio preacher for Christian Crusaders, this ministry that oversees the pot, the CC podcast. So come out to the Cedar Falls Bible Conference for a free week of encouragement from Scripture, great ministries for students and children, great food, great fellowship, July 25th through August 1st. And I almost forgot to mention, we've got Mark Schultz and Christy Knuckles coming to do some musical stuff as well. So see at the Cedar Falls Bible Conference. You can get more on Facebook or go to cedarfallsbibleconference.com. But let's get back to your story. So uh, you are coming up through the ranks, playing above your grade, developing as a basketball player. I don't think I ever came and saw you play basketball even one time. Um, but when when did you start getting into football? And, and basketball was kind of always, or football was always kind of your second love, wasn't it? Yeah. All the way through high school almost, mm -hmm. or at least through your junior year. Yeah. Yeah, I would say so. So um, talk about that. Football started in, well, I was playing like flag, but tackle, I think fifth grade was my first year. Uh, was too heavy to play like quarterback or anything. So 90 I played, pounds, right? Yeah, you sports football? Like, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still the same. Yeah. Uh, so I played tight end, and I don't really remember those days that that well. I just remember playing. I remember we were on the Titans, and I mean, it was, I mean, I always liked football. I didn't have, you know, it wasn't like ba baseball was super boring to me, but basketball was number one, and I would work on that year round. Then when football season came around, it's not like a sport that you can, you know, you can't, I mean, you can go out and play catch, but you can't, you know, really develop your craft on football like you can with basketball or baseball. So when football would come around, I'd get fired up about that. And then, you know, when football season was coming to an end, I'd roll into basketball. And basketball would kind of carry me through the whole year. Uh, junior high, similar. Um, still really love basketball. Um, but football, never played quarterback until my sophomore year in high school. Uh, so that's a whole – that is a really skill-based position. So worked on that a lot. Started focusing a lot more on football because you you know you have to. If you How did that happen? How did you not play quarterback until your sophomore year? Um, the quarterback that was kind of in our grade the entire time had gotten hurt, so we needed somebody to play for the sophomore team. And you were playing what? I was playing tight end, receiver, you know, D end. Uh, so then I just started working quarterback stuff. Played sophomore year. Uh, started on varsity junior year. At quarterback, uh, had a weird injury deal, kept me out probably half the season, mm -hmm. came back at the end of the season. Um, and then, you know, went going in, go ahead. You, you guys one. went pretty deep into the yeah, playoffs that junior the year, right? Finals. So yeah. I came back and played in the semifinal game. That's, I kind of started showing up to watch you play football at CF in the dome. Must have been during the end of that, it must have been after your injury because I don't remember you being injured. Yeah. I came back for the end of the season. Yeah. Number 18, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. So uh, that's your junior year. Yeah. And and you you went to the semifinals? Yep. So, I mean, you're getting some exposure. Yeah. As a quarterback. Yeah. As a quarterback. Yeah. Um, and there's some other kids on your team who are getting a lot of exposure. Yeah. And so, um, so the clinic that you went to at Iowa was between your junior and senior year? Yes. And... So I've heard this story from your dad. I've probably told it. I hope I've told it right because I've told it five or ten times to just different people. I think it's an incredible story how the Lord just, mm -hmm. just this almost miraculous aligning of of events and timelines, and, and here you are at the end of it. Um, 
So you're getting invited to this clinic. Why? You're not even a standout quarterback. I mean, you're good. Your team went to the the I mean, it's semifinals. So, so uh, I'll take it back to maybe my sophomore junior year. So we got like Barkley Hill running back, who's going to Iowa. We got Ross Piercebacher. We got James Harrington. I think those were Ross mm-hmm. Piercebacher ends up being one yeah. of the best linemen in the country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they, I mean, Iowa knows that. So we always have scouts in, you know, Cedar Falls High School just coming to check in on guys that run so So I remember one day I get called to the office to, like, just with them. And I'm wearing, I, I'll never forget this, I'm wearing, like, an Oregon shirt mm-hmm. that says 12-0 and 0 on it because they had gone undefeated the season before. And I, I mean, I was a casual uh college football fan i i mean i love the hawks always had loved the hawks growing up and i remember dad taking me to a michigan game and tony moyaki scoring a touchdown you know exactly what play i'm talking about yeah so i was always a big iowa fan but you know getting recruited to play like i said it was always kind of basketball was my thing so you know wearing an oregon shirt into the recruiting office you know with (laughs) brian ferentz and Reese Morgan was like, I didn't even think twice about it. But Brian will still joke with me. He's like, I'll never forget when you walked in with that on. <laughs> <laughs> but I was just like, I was completely clueless. So, you know, you just meet with them and talk. What, what year was this? Your junior year? Yeah. Okay. And so, wasn't it your head coach <clears throat> and t- told Brian yeah. that he needed to meet you? So Coach Mitchell uh, and Coach Remmert would, you know, they'd call these coaches. Who should we talk to? Um, And Brian tells the story pretty good. He's you know, big kid, lanky kid, but he's got this Oregon shirt on. You know. No way, no way. Uh, so anyway, they invited me just to come to camp, which anybody can go to their camp. Um, but they invited me to come to camp, so I'm like, sure, I'll go. I just wanted to learn some because I'd been playing quarterback for like a year and a half, so I'm like, I'm going to try to learn some stuff. And you're getting ready to play quarterback your senior year. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so yeah. it's like, I'm going to go as a quarterback. Yeah. And as his dad, I was saying, I, you know, we were playing basketball all summer, like I mentioned, with his team, doing a lot of fun there. And I knew the football season was coming. I said, we got you know, we got to get to some of these camps, just do a little bit of football here. Yeah, and just to get ready. So I'm like, all right, whatever. So I show <laughs> up to the camp, and as I'm, like, checking in, Reese Morgan comes over. He's like, hey, do you want to try tight end, like, today just do half quarterback half tight end just run a couple routes and i didn't bring my i hadn't brought my pads because if you were quarterback you didn't need to bring your pads but any other position they were going to like do a couple drills with your pads on tell me if this is true this is what i heard or maybe i fabricated in my mind was there like a shortage of tight ends that day and they needed they needed some tight ends to do more reps there was one other tight end Yeah. yeah one other which is unheard of i mean that's tight end you and this guy this guy, but there's not like you know, there's not one camp. There's like a week. Right, there's full six of camps. camps so. and, and a couple other things, if I could interject. Absolutely. When when the Hawkeye coaches came to visit Ike, he you sent a text maybe home or, or called mom, and she was working in our barn, and I was actually out working on a manure spreader. And she comes running out to me and says, "Oh boy, we need to pray." She was just. She, she had this feeling when she heard that the Hawkeye coaches were talking to him that the Lord was up to something. And we need to pray. And she was all concerned. She does not like football. She doesn't like the, you know, the intensity of the sport, the roughness of the sport. And I kind of smiled at her and I said, well, let's give thanks. And she said, no, 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 we need to pray for <laughs> And uh, so... I'll never forget that standing there with her. And it was really hard on her. And then we got signed up for this camp. And the night before, I was supposed to go fishing with some guys. And I was laying in bed with Chris talking about the fishing trip. And I thought, Ike's going to the camp. And literally, in my mind, I felt like, oh, my word, I need to take him to this camp. I got to cancel my You just all of a sudden were convicted. I better do this. Yes, I better take him. That's incredible. And so I texted the guys that night and said, guys, I have to go to Iowa City tomorrow. I won't be on the fishing trip. And that's when I got up and took Ike down there. And so that was, I feel like that was the Lord already kind of intervening to make an adjustment in our lives. What I was just going to say, one of the things we want to do with these podcasts is not just tell a cool story. 
where the Lord was at work. But hopefully there's connection points to people who hear this. And one of the connection points I just thought of is that's a great specific example of just how the Spirit leads yes. and guides us. Yes. I mean, you lay in bed talking mm-hmm. about the plans for the next day, and you just get this sense, I need to change my plans. Yes. And thankfully, you're obedient to that. Yeah. And you know, I think of the Proverbs, a man plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps, especially if you're listening. Yes. You know? And So that was a Friday, right? Uh, it was I a think. Thursday night, and the camp was on a Friday. Yep. So you go down on Friday. Yeah. And... So you're checking in. Yeah. And Reese Morgan <laughs> said that, you know, would you like to try tight end out? And I'm like, sure. If a coach is asking me to do something, I'm going to do it. You know, he's probably got my best interests in mind or wants to see something. Time out. That's another great lesson. If coach is asking me to do something, I probably better do it. Yeah. Yeah. Keep absolutely. going. Absolutely. We'll come back to that in a little bit too. So I'm go, I go out there and I'm, th- I mean, I'm doing some quarterback stuff and I've never in my life thrown one of these college footballs. So, I mean, I'm trash. Like I was just remember being like, <laughs> I'm, I'm like, I was never fully in on being quarterback. I just wanted to learn a few things. And then he put that in my mind that I could try, you know, playing tight end. So I'm like, all right. I just said, I'm, I'll do tight end for the rest of the day, basically with no pads. Yeah. So, I mean, I didn't have to block or anything that day, but I just remember running routes. And me and this other, this one other kid are running routes, and uh, I don't like to talk great about myself, but I destroyed anybody that they put up against me. Like, <laughs> I, dro- I didn't drop a single pass. Can I tell um, you? Your dad told me this story shortly after, within a couple of days, and he said that the quarterbacks. I hope I hope none of them remember who they were. The quarterbacks couldn't hit the broad side of a barn, and they said Ike was catching everything within about five yards that they would throw to you. Yeah, I mean it was like, and then insane. and then you were lined up against some defensive end that was a stud, and you were that playing was, well against that him. That was on Monday. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. I'm ahead. Yeah. Of, okay, yeah. I would just interject quick. Is I'm sitting in the stands watching this, and the other this is at t- Kinnick Stadium. Yeah, and I'm at the south end alone, sitting in the south end down near the where they come to get drinks. And the other tight end, he's probably five, six. He's a little guy. He, he's not even in shape enough to run across the field. So when they call the tight ends over, basically Ike's going to run a lot of routes, which I think was another thing. God had just set it up yeah. so that Ike would be there. They would see him run a lot of routes. And literally with no pads on, the D-backs had pads. He was going up, grabbing this ball, ripping it down, just – Dominant. I think it was 21 or 22 passes in a row he caught while being defended. And that is awesome. It was awesome. And I sat in the south end watching this unfold, and coach after coach was kind of walking over saying something to Ike. And then Kirk Ferentz came over and started talking to you. And when that happened, I thought to myself, this was kind of, oh my word. I'm just seeing the Lord's plan unfold right here. It just felt like that to me. That's awesome. And so then the camp continued. Yeah, so, I mean, that's really all I remember from that first day. And then I remember coming back. At the end of camp, though, at the end of the day, tell about that. At the end of the day, they just asked, you know, would you come back on Monday and bring your pads? We just want to see if you, how would you, how you do blocking and Did they take you into the facility and show you around a little bit? What was happened that, was Scott Southmade came over. He kind of coordinates the team there. He came over to me sitting in the stands, and he said, are you Ike's dad? And I said, yeah. He said, would you come down on the field a minute? And we got to chatting a little in the center of the field with Kirk, a few other coaches. And then they turned to Ike and said, well, you know, we can't pay for you to come back or anything, but if you want to come back on Monday and bring your pads, we'd love to have you try blocking. Well, and then you were... Yeah. Right in on that. Yeah. But I had a, so I had an actual quarterback camp the following day at U and I. Saturday. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which was like an all day thing. Eight hour camp. Yeah. Which was great. I mean, it was great. It was fun. But I mean, all I was thinking about was going back on Monday, you know. So then I get like a di- nice little day of rest on the Sabbath. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now it's your work day. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then I go down to 
Iowa City and basically do everything again. You know, just do everything again. So following with pads on and then do some blocking at the end, which they put me up against a few like average kids. I did okay. And then they put me up against the best guy there and I just gave it all I had, but it just wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, he, but they love, you know, but they love that. Um, because I, this kid probably had 50, 60 pounds on me. Yeah. So hang I on just, a sec. Yeah. So I, I remember part of the story. They, didn't Chris and Aid go with you? Yeah, they were in Monday? Des Moines for that weekend, and I was calling and telling them everything that was going on. So they drove over, and we met at Kinnick, and we watched that practice. And so we were all sitting in stands. Now, this is in the north end zone where they have him blocking. Mm -hmm. And we're sitting there, and, yeah, they put him up against this monster <laughs> defensive guy at the end. And I fired off and just got a jump on him, and then it was, you know, he's I also, overpowered. I think you said something about on the car ride down, it must have been just you and Ike if they came over from Des Moines, on the car ride down, he's got his helmet and his pads or whatever he had to bring to camp, and you're just like, you know what? I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm just going to go for broke and see what happens. Yeah. I mean, something yeah. like that. He's going to give it all he had. Yeah. And we didn't know. You know, we thought for sure, okay, at this point, they're going to say they like him, they're going to watch him. So we're all sitting in the stands. And after he's done blocking, Scott South made this, you know, guy who helps coordinate the Hawkeye team. He comes over and says, hey, can you guys stick around again for a little while? And I think he said, Coach, I'd like to show you, meet with you in his office, and we'd like to show you around a little. And we're like, well, yeah, I think we got time. <laughs> I think we have time. And that's when we, you got shown around a little, and then we went into Kirk's office and sat there. And, uh, you know, the culture around there, I just say this, that it's not just about football. I mean, they care about people. And we could feel that sitting in there. And we probably sat in there for 45 minutes, talked about a lot of different things. And I remember Kirk turning to you three times. And he turned to Ike and said, Ike, do you want to come here? Do you, do you remember that? Uh, the whole thing's kind of a blur. Yeah. But, yeah, I mean, I remember sitting in there. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and Ike affirmed, yeah, yeah, Coach, I'd like to come here. And he three times got him to say yes. And then Coach Ferentz said, well, we're going we're gonna to find a way to make this happen. And he explained a few things about where they were at, scholarships and all that. And at that point, I was like, wow, this has all happened pretty fast. Yeah. You know, I mean, it was just Friday, and we're, we're looking at basketball <clears throat> and where he was going to play basketball. And I said, Coach, you know, it's a big decision for you guys. I'm sure who you give scholarships to, and it's a big decision for us. I said, do you mind if we say a prayer? And no, no, Coach Ferentz, he took his hat off. And bowed. <laughs> awesome. And we went right into a prayer. And it was fantastic. And I, I don't remember what I prayed except for just for some guidance and wisdom. And he must have thought of this while he was praying, but he thought of a book he wanted us to know about. And so right after the prayer, he invited us into his other office and he pulled out a book. He had five books on top of a file cabinet. He pulled off the bottom one and he said, I can't give it to you because of NCAA regulations, but... If you want to read this book, this is kind of my philosophy. And it's a book about developing people through athletics. And my wife devoured the book in two days. She hardly reads, you know. And that really kind of, it just was like the Lord was bringing this together and he gave us a picture of what he's doing through that. And that was a neat experience for all of us. So two things for you. Are, are you ever, like, in that setting, are you kind of like, Dad, seriously, we're praying right now? Are, embarrassed by that or just kind of like, oh, my dad's a preacher, but I don't want to tell anyone that? Or, uh, I'd <laughs> say the exact opposite, really. Um, and that's something as I've gotten older, like when I'll go out to eat with buddies or, you know, I'm with some people for a weekend, like, I feel like I might not be thinking anything about uh, you know, the Lord in that moment or time. But then if a meal comes up or something like pops into my head, I have like this conviction mm. that comes over me that's like, you need to say a prayer. And then if I don't, which I have yet to this day turned it down, like turn that feeling down. But, uh, you know, like I feel like I have to do something, but it's like it's very, it's very, it comes very easy mm -hmm. to me. But I think that you know, has developed over a long, long period of time and seeing how my dad has, you know, been in how many different circumstances and 
way way more stress stress filled situations dealing with families or dealing with a couple or dealing with whoever and he can sit down and just say a, like a calm prayer that kind of you know gives a basically a deep breath for everybody yep um so if he can do that then you know that you know saying a prayer in front of you know with Kirk Ferentz yeah you know, when however many other things are going on in his his mind then I can say a prayer for a meal. That's awesome. That's the least I could do. The other thing I was going to ask you is, so your dad just alluded to this. You were thinking about playing basketball in college, what, maybe like D3, D2? Yeah, D2 somewhere. And uh, as late as Thursday night, and by like, well, probably by Friday night, you're kind of like, okay, there's actually some interest in me playing football. And then by Monday night, it's like, this is going to happen. And if I remember a couple nights later, Ference calls you, you're watching an NBA Finals game, and he's like, hey, we got you a scholarship. Do you want to come on board? Yeah, I mean. Basically, right? So so in just a few days, I mean. I didn't even think it was real in my <laughs> mind. Until, you know, I didn't, <laughs> until he called and said, like, we have a scholarship for you. That was, the you know, that made it real to me. So I wasn't even, I was still wasn't even thinking about it. I was like, you know, they can do this or that or say this or that. But, you know, the University of Iowa is not really like that at all. Um, if they say something, they mean it. So getting, you know, a scholarship offer from them, I was like, okay, this is real. And then I committed within like two days. Or yeah, two, it was a days. week. T two more things on that story. One, you know, if I had kind of – it was a little stretch to ask to say a prayer – but I think during that prayer, I don't think we would have gotten that book. And we've given out many copies of that book since then. And that book is, it's a great book about sports and the balance about it. And then secondly, you know, when you got that phone call and they offered this, this scholarship, you know, there was the, there's the option of kind of waiting and messing around with other schools going to offer and this kind of thing. And you got a call probably 20 seconds after Kirk Ferentz called you from Iowa State, and then Michigan Michigan State came yeah. later, and some of those, and we were, it was a week later, Friday, we were driving to Okaboji, and you said from the back, geez, Dad, how long did I take? I know I want to go to Iowa, and, and I think you called him on that trip Friday afternoon yeah. and just said, yep, I'm coming to, I'm going to be a Hawkeye. Yeah, I didn't, I had no interest in messing around with no. that. So how does the word get out? I mean, once one domino falls, everyone else starts coming? Uh, I don't know. Kids play into that so much now, too, with Twitter. Or, yeah. You know, I had zero interest in that, but kids love, you know, I just got my 18th offer. Well, then from blah, 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 then another school sees that, and they're like, oh, we should offer this kid. You know, kids, like, have it as a trophy now, how many scholarship offers they can get. For me, it was like there's no place I'd rather be. Yeah. So it was a really easy choice. So Ike becomes a Hawkeye. Okay, so this is starting to get close to my heart because the Hawkeye, I mean, I've been a Hawkeye fan since I was knee-high to a grasshopper. I mean, I remember all the great, you know, I've been, you know, growing up, my parents had tickets and in, in the shadows of Kinnick Stadium, I tell people that's where I was raised. Mm -hmm. And uh, so now here's the son of one of my favorite families and he's going to be a Hawkeye. And so that was really exciting for us. Um, so you get into your Hawkeye career. And I remember uh, you were redshirted. Yep. And then did you play your freshman year? So half halfway through my freshman year, going back to the point of, you know, coaches have your best interest in mind, we didn't really have tackles uh, being recruited. You know, we didn't have very many tackles coming up. And we had a plethora of <coughs> tight ends and a lot of good tight ends. So – I remember being in Coach Ferentz's office and meeting with Brian Ferentz um, and DJ Hernandez, actually Aaron Hernandez's brother, who's my coach at the time. And they were just like, you know, we could see you playing tight end, but there's a lot, there's, you know, there's a backup really at that position right now. What do you think about moving to tackle? Uh, we think you could, you know, be really good there, be good on the offensive line and would fit in the room really well. So... I basically thought about that for, you know, 24 hours. I'm like, all right, yeah, let's do that. Because, like I said, they have your best interest in mind. They got the team's best interest in mind. So, you know, I talked to mom and dad about it, told mom I'd take less hits to the head. So that was an easy, 
<laughs> that was easy, easy for her. Uh, and then I just started working on that. Uh, and then that next year after I was redshirting, I started playing a little bit. Maybe saw action in four or five games, I think. So here, I, I totally forgot to mention that. So you got re- you're playing quarterback. You go to camp as a quarterback. Yeah. Uh, you move over to tight end in the middle of that clinic. Yeah. Uh, they recruit you basically as a tight end, mm-hmm. and then you get there and they're like, uh, "Why don't you go to the offensive line?" Mm-hmm. Which I mean, if anyone knows college football, offensive line at Iowa is you got a great shot of doing great things. And so just, again, the Lords through the coaches kind of having your best interest in mind guiding all this. I remember um, would have been your red shirt freshman year. You were playing some special teams mm-hmm. initially. Mm-hmm. Number and the, 99 at that time. Yeah, that's right. Yep. And then I remember uh, the Ball State game. I remember this very vividly. And we were sitting at the top of the student section right under the press box. That's yeah. always where we sit, like down on the end zone in the – South end. Yeah. And your parents are sitting down where the parents sit, kind of on the 25 yard line or whatever, down low. Mm-hmm. And and you're on the sideline. And so we've got this bird's eye view because we're way up high. And Brandon Scherf gets hurt. He's the tackle in front of Ike. That's right. And, and I had heard from I had heard from Tim that if if Scherf, if something happens to Scherf, Ike's probably gonna come in behind him. And so Scherf goes down on the sideline way down in the corner where you couldn't even see it. No. And I immediately, I was with Mason, I immediately go, oh, my gosh, Ike's going in right now. And and Mason, I'm trying to explain this to Mason because he didn't know the backstory. And I, I remember finding you on the sideline and thinking, Ike doesn't know this because he can't see down the sideline to see that that's Brandon Scherf. And then I and then I found Tim and Chris in the stands, and Tim's pacing around. <laughs> By this time, you've walked up to the top of the entrance, and you're kind of, so I went downstairs and talked to Tim, and uh, it's like this is for real. Like this is your first chance to really play. And do you remember what happened with that drive? I don't. You guys, I went, you guys went down and scored. Did, did they? They oh, scored on I, Ike's first drive. Is that right? Yeah, you don't remember that. Well, what I do remember is that he hadn't even been playing O line for a year. I mean, he, he was a quarterback, okay? And then he's a tight end. <laughs> and now he's going in to back up the, you know, I mean, Brandon Scherf went number five in the draft. He was one of the I greatest mean, yeah. linemen ever. Yeah. And he's still he's still out there. And so then Ike's going in to back him up. And I was like, man, I, I don't, I just couldn't handle it. You know, you got all those people there. That's why I had to walk up and stand <laughs> at the railing. And just... I think he was 75 at that time. Oh, yeah, I was at that point in the season. I s- switched over. I started playing. Like, I would bring two jerseys <clears throat> That's right. out to the game later in the season because they wanted me playing that, like, jumbo tight end. But, yeah, I just remember because, I, like you said, I couldn't see it. So Brian comes up, and he's the O-line coach at the time. He, he comes up. He's like... You got to go in. He said the look on my face was like. <laughs> What's well, I, 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 I specifically remember watching that develop, and I remember thinking, I we wish I could see Ike's helmet. face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think you started walking, and then you're like, oh crap, my helmet, and he went back to get yeah. his helmet. I mean, I weighed like 275, maybe. <laughs> and, you know, but I did fine. And, yeah. Uh, but that was, yeah, that, I'll never forget that. That was unreal. That's awesome. So, uh, Sophomore year, you have an ankle injury. Yeah, so then I start. So Sheriff graduates and the other tackle graduates, Andrew Denal. So we got two new tackles starting sophomore season, and that's like our best year and, you know, some consider it the best year in Iowa football history. Sixth game of the season, I get rolled up on pretty good. Uh, that was your sophomore season? Mm-hmm. The Rose Bowl season? Yeah. Oh, wow. And we were six and all. It was homecoming, like of the week of my twenty first birthday. I, it was a big week, so you know I was super. We were playing Illinois. They had a really good front. They got a few, call it the two, I think three guys from that defensive line. They're still playing in the NFL, so it was a good opportunity. And you know I was playing good in that game, and just a freak thing happened down at the goal line. Uh, high ankle sprain that kept me out until the Rose Bowl game. Uh, so that was an interesting challenge. You know, first year starting, we haven't lost yet. We're re- rolling really good. And then I get, you know, I missed the, you know, eight, nine weeks after 
we're six and oh and we just keep doing great which i had a lot of fun you know being a part of it but it was super frustrating too because i'm like i know i could should be out there playing but i physically just couldn't get my my ankle figured out so i finally got it figured out and then literally like the week that i get it figured out i got the mumps <laughs> which was i never knew that the yeah, most did. random thing of all time so i was quarantined in my my room for a week 10 days or something then we went out go out to la for the rose bowl and i played just basically jumbo tight end in that game didn't play a lot we got smacked anyway uh i was sitting at the so it's been my dream since i was 10 years old to see the hawkeyes play in the rose bowl and so, Tim, obviously, we saw you out there yeah. a couple times. And when we walked into that stadium, I had my dad with me and my son and some friends. And it's just like, oh, my gosh, my dream is happening. This is so awesome that the turf looks so beautiful and the Hawkeyes on the field look so beautiful getting ready for the game. And then we're down 35 nothing in, like, the third quarter, first quarter. Yeah. And But, you know, I was, I was probably different for you guys. But I was just sitting there like, you know what, like, we're at the Rose Bowl. Who cares? Yeah. Like this is awesome. Yeah. It was a beautiful night. Yeah. Great memory. I would I would ask, like, you know, during that season when your ankle got hurt, do you do you feel like the Lord was showing you anything? Yeah, yeah that I was time? just gonna gonna get to that. So I uh you know, I was on pace just kind of right where I would say I was planning to be, you know, starting as a sophomore. I'm gonna start for three years, you know, two, three years. If I play really good for two years, I could leave. Mm -hmm. If I play a really good three years, you know, you never know what's going to happen. So I'd say that's been a common theme in my life. When I think I have something planned out, you know, God's usually got a way of bringing me back down. If I get my, you know, head a little too big, I start thinking I'm doing this. You know, the Lord put me at the University of Iowa. He got me to, you know, switch to offensive line. So now it doesn't just all of a sudden become me. Uh, and I think he really brought me back down to earth through that season. And, uh, you know, I, I feel like when I had my more serious injury my senior year, I, I felt that was different. But uh, I don't know. There was just I was going down a path. I wasn't going down really a bad path, but it was just like I was a little too, you know, oh, I'm doing pretty good right here. Mm -hmm. And uh so that really humbled me, I'd say, and really brought like a little more fire out of me Come after I got that figured out and came back for my junior season mm -hmm. um, and really refocused me. And I think that's such a simple, it's very easy to happen to somebody that's, you know, having some success doing something. And then you kind of are short selling yourself in the long run. Um, I don't think you can ever reach your full potential if you get, uh, you know, comfortable and uh, think you got this figured out where, you know, you can never reach your full potential as hard as you try. I mean, you you might be able to get close, but you'll never be, you know, the best in the world. That's something the best of all time. There's always somebody that's probably going to be able to do it better. So for me, it was like I was never close to Sheriff at this point, but Sheriff was always somebody that I look up to. And I'm like, I'm kind of following in his, you know, footsteps like I could I could do what he did. Um, and that really like shut it down for me and just brought me back to the Lord. And, you know, my faith, I thought my faith was really strong, but that, you know, tested it. And I'd say, I'd say I really came through it a lot better person and, you know, husband now, just a guy to be around because of that. That's great. So fast forward to the injury your senior year. Mm -hmm. Like what you said, that was different. Like, how was that one different in terms of how, Maybe the Lord used it to shape you. Did you learn other things through that? Or I, I suppose you should tell people what the injury was. And Yeah, and maybe the the junior year you came back and played and, you know, didn't have quite the success of a season, but the, then the O-line won the Joe Moore Award. So they yes. they were operating well together through that, and that was a great year and uh, really, really fun, successful, strong year, and you're really excited going into that senior what, year. What bowl did you go to that year? Outback Bowl. And beat? We lost to uh, okay. Florida. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a good point to bring up. Joe Moore Award is like it's like the, the best offensive line in the country. Mm -hmm. I think it's the sweetest statue of all the yeah. great, great awards. But to be on the Joe Moore winning offensive line, I mean, as long as you don't get injured, now you've got a serious shot at getting picked up by an NFL team. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a pretty reputable thing. 
So, yeah, that's great. And then you go into your senior season, Iowa State. Yeah, so my mindset after that sophomore injury was pretty much, you know, straightforward. I was I, I felt like I was where I needed to be with the Lord. I felt like I was operating at a pretty, you know, good level with my relationship with the Lord. And there was just something kind of off for me with football. And I, I still can't to this day really say what it was, but it was, I was kind of not, I wouldn't say I was burnt out on football, but I was just like, man, like I just want to go try and make it in the NFL, but I still got this season. This season is kind of like in the way of mm. what I, my biggest goal was. And that wasn't the right mindset at all to have, but it was just, you know, how I was kind of thinking. So, you know, I was kind of going through the motions a little bit. Um, I would say during camp my senior year, I'm like, gosh, I just want to get to the game, you know. It's a, it's a long preparation, you know. There's a lot of work in these camps and beating on each other, and it can get old by your senior year. I'm by year. the fourth year. I mean, yeah, no, it's the like the fifth, fifth year. The fifth, fifth year. Yeah. Been here, done this, yeah. blah, yeah. blah, blah. Yeah, so that's, you know, there's nothing I regret about it because that's just kind of how – I mean, I, that's how my mindset was. You know, I was working just as hard as I always was, but it was just like when I got out there, it was just like, gosh, just get me to the games. Well, okay, we started playing the games. By first game my senior year, I didn't play very good. And then second game of the season's Iowa State. So, you know, I'm fired up about that. We're all fired up about that. And I had this, I don't know, I, I still can't even describe this feeling I had going into this game. But it was like I was very excited to play. I was, you know, I played. I was playing good in the game, but there was just this feeling, like in my mind, like I wasn't myself. Basically, my entire senior year, mm-hmm. and then I just doing a basic play, and the Achilles deal happened, and uh, you know, it was it sucked and it was terrible and it was a big challenge that I ended up, you know, overcoming, but. I just had this feeling in my my head that that entire season of it just I wasn't normal I wasn't myself and I I, I still you know like I said I don't know what it was but uh I don't have that feeling at all anymore but it was just that probably that six six or seven weeks but really during spring ball even going to my senior year I was just kind of like uh, like I was just kind of like burn out mm-hmm. um. And I don't know if that was just the Lord's way of just getting me out of that so I didn't just totally trash my senior season and, you know, ruin a chance in the NFL, which didn't happen. Um, Well, almost did with, you know, the injury. But just coming back from that, though, has been, like, one of the biggest things that I've, you know, overcome, the biggest thing I've overcome in my life and has really changed my entire outlook on football, sports, everything just knowing how soon something can get taken away from you and just to never take, you know, take, I should have learned it my sophomore season, but how quick something can get taken away from you and that it could just be gone forever. So your sophomore season though, you're probably still kind of thinking, yeah, I, always I don't know hope. what my future is. Yeah. I've got time. Your mm-hmm. senior season, it's right there. Yeah. You mm-hmm. won the Joe Moore, Joe Moore award. You're probably going to get drafted as long as you stay healthy. And then, yeah. And then it's gone. Yeah. Yeah. He was definitely, you know, being projected in the draft. And so then you see all that just kind of boom. And I remember after the injury, we didn't know what had happened. You sat on the bench the whole game. It was so hot, by the way. I mean, it was over. In Ames. Yeah, I remember it was like that game. 118 degrees on the field or something. And they, the Hawks ended up winning. But we were waiting out where the players come out, and the the team doctor came out and got me and asked me to come in. And when I walked in, there's a hallway before you turn into the locker room. And just outside the locker room was was both Ferences, Kirk and Brian. And when they looked at me, I mean, they had they beat the you know they beat Iowa State. Celebration going on, and these guys both have glassy eyes. Just because it hurt them, you know, like season being over, they were, it just, they felt terrible for us. They felt terrible for him. We had a good little talk there and they just told me it's, you know, it, it, and I remember Kirk saying it won't hurt his future, his long-term future, but he's done with the serious for this season. Yeah. And, uh, 
before we get to the NFL, let's. Um, how do you stay connected to the Lord during? Um, obviously, going to college, you got to go to class. You got stuff to do school wise, but then the intensity and the time commitment of playing football. Um, I you were connected with um, I forget the guy's name down there, Jim Goodrich. Yeah. Yep. A- yeah. And so there's some some mechanisms in place for guys who want to walk with the Lord in that setting can do that. But but how do you kind of mind that? And and you're walking with a bunch of teammates, roommates, friends, whatever it is, who maybe aren't on that same spiritual trajectory as you, even though your lives are very similar in other ways. Yeah. Um, I think that's one of the coolest things about football is you get guys from all different backgrounds um, that come together because you have so, such a wide variety of positions that people are playing. So, you know, in basketball, it's just you're a basketball player. You know, you might be taller, but you got, you know, real strong – hefty midwest kids or you got super athletic kids from florida you know texas california whatever and then you all come together um and have to form a team so you're taking different religions backgrounds uh ethnicities and you're all combining together in one place and you're together a lot like you're together way more than anybody else Mm -hmm. and you know, that's a huge credit to just the coaching staff and the culture at Iowa. And I think it's very similar in Buffalo, which is cool to see, but they just, you know, really care about the guys and how they're going to act when football's not there. Mm -hmm. So if that's your main focus, then the football culture like really takes care of itself because we got guys hanging out all the time outside of football. Um, whether it's, you know, in Buffalo or in Iowa, which is, I think very rare. Uh, you live together, so you leave the facility hanging out with guys. You got the same schedule. You're waking up early. You're grinding together. You're, you know, setting a squat record. You're puking together. (laughs) You know, you're doing literally everything together. Um, and I think those things really draw you a lot closer. Uh, you see a guy push a sled for however many yards, and he's got to go to the trash can to puke, but you're feeling the same way. And then you get through it and you can like laugh and, you know, Mm -hmm. joke, you know, there's something about that that you can't, you know, you don't get those bonds Mm -hmm. uh, anywhere else. And I think that's the, you know, one of the best things that Doyle does Mm -hmm. down in Iowa City is that culture part. So the religion part is definitely there's a there's a group of guys, you know, that stick together that also have that bond. So that makes it even stronger. And. I've been blessed on both teams to have a pretty big group. Um, and it, you know, it differs every year. But there's chapel on Friday night, which a lot of coaches, a lot of players go to. But then almost every week we would have Bible study at my house um, in Iowa City. So there's some, sometimes I'd be two or three guys show up, sometimes 10, 15. And there's always a variety of different guys. But, you know, then you have that connection. And that's, I think, the biggest thing that helps, you know, athletes is having the just guy-to-guy time where you can talk about the Lord and talk about issues that you're not going to get talked about anywhere else. Hey, everybody, want to break in here real quick and point you to a website called issuesiface.com, which might be really helpful for you or somebody you know. At issuesiface.com, you can read a bunch of articles written by people who follow Christ and who've gone through a bunch of different struggles or faced a lot of issues in their life. The other thing you can do is request an anonymous online mentor who will listen to you and pray for you, encourage you, point you to Christ, point you to Scripture. If there's anything that you're facing in your life that is uh, maybe you don't want to talk face-to-face about it with somebody, maybe it'd be better to talk to an online mentor anonymously. This is a great way to do that. And uh, issuesiface.com, the mentors affiliated with that website, and that ministry are there for you. So check it out today, issuesiface.com. One thing I've noticed observing you, and I haven't, I mean, we're not way close. We haven't spent any time on the road together or living together or anything like that. But from my observation from not way far away, but not way close, is that you do a really good job of hanging out with that wide range of guys. Um, And and genuinely fitting in with them. I mean, mm-hmm. and even if even if 
some of them have a completely different bedrock value system than you do. And, uh, you know, it, it's kind of a fine balance because how do you, on one hand, hang out with a bunch of non-believers, as an example, who um, are doing this and living that way without getting pulled into that? Uh, and then on the other hand, um, how do you, you know, keep your witness without kind of alienating yourself from them? Yeah. Uh, and this is something that I want, uh, as I coach basketball. Yeah. I think sports provides a great, now it's at a Christian school, so it's a little bit different. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but um, I want our kids and I want my kids, my own kids, to get this. Uh, what kind of advice or how, how would you coach somebody to be a Christian in the world effectively without compromising their own values or their own witness, uh, but on the other hand, living with people in such a way that doesn't you don't alienate yourself or isolate yourself from them. Do you understand yeah, what I'm saying? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, so one end of the spectrum is guys that are very, you know, quote unquote religious and are going to talk down to people that are, are living that lifestyle um, and say, you know, what you're doing is wrong, which, okay, you want to call them out, call them out maybe face to face. Um, and talk them through, you know, what you are, you know, seeing about what they're doing isn't right, you know, but everybody, like I said, everybody's raised so differently. So for you, that's raised maybe in a, you know, Christian from beginning to now for you to go up to a guy and tell him how he should be acting or what he's doing is wrong. Like what, I don't what, what right do you have to do that? when he was raised this certain way and maybe he's, you know, on the up, upward trend of where he's going, you know, there's ways to say, say stuff to guys that is completely appropriate. And, you know, when I see that it's fit, I would do that. But there's, there's also the opposite way where you're saying like, if you go out and go to the bars and, you know, sleep around and we're going to lose football games, this is the reason we're losing football games like absolutely not. Yeah. You know, if you start blaming certain things on the outcomes of certain things, there's some of the biggest freaks you'll see in athletics do not live a, you know, a great lifestyle outside of their sport. Yep. And so I think it's you have to be very careful. First of all, um, whether you're a coach or a teammate of these guys, how you go about doing that, and then just hanging out with them, you know. I can hang out with these guys and not do everything that they're doing. And they're going to respect my decision as much as I'm going to respect their decision. Mm -hmm. And maybe, you know, here, there, give a couple, you know, nuggets of like, you know, they might be struggling with something. I'd be like, well, have you thought about changing this? Mm -hmm. Or, you know, like you can do it very simply and you're not being judgmental mm -hmm. and you're not, you know, beating them down for what they're doing mm -hmm. when, where you don't know their background. You don't know what they've come from. And what they've seen, mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of things that guys are trying to get away from by mm -hmm. doing, you know, certain things. Uh, and it really all comes back to the Lord. But, you know, you think in your head, like, well, that should be so easy to know not to do that. Well, in your mind, you've been trained yeah, with this mindset. When you're saying um, you don't have any right to tell somebody who's been raised differently than you that that's not right. You're, you're not saying that there's no truth and there's no absolutes. You're, you're just talking about how you approach that exactly. with people, how you interact with people. Like there's a way to do it very appropriately than just like coming down on them right away in, in a way that I think is v like inappropriate in a sports football setting. Yeah. Um, because, or even worse is going and like telling on these kids for something they're doing, getting an author authoritative figure involved to then bring it down, bring them down instead of just, okay, if something, if you know a guy's doing something that's inappropriate, you bring them just you and him and you have like a little talk. If he wants to completely reject you and say, I'm just going to keep doing this, that's fine. But just showing them, you know, what the correct or, you know, how the Lord would like to see things done you're just telling them you're not saying you're a bad human being because of this. Yep. And I mean, you're there to play football for the Hawkeyes. That's, exactly. You, it's not like you all signed a contract to 
follow Jesus as good as possible. No. Because not everyone's on that page. Exactly. So I can imagine... Um, you know, the road that you've walked. I mean, do some of those guys look at Ike Butker and go, this guy, this guy's a little bit uh, fanatical or, or ultra religious, or, I mean, do they give you any crap about that or do they respect it? Or how, how does that all play it out? No, I, I don't think anybody would describe me as, as that. I would say, you know, if somebody was looking at me that I've interacted with like that, they would say there's something just different. Mm-hmm. Um, because I'm not, I'm not, I, I'm very turned off. There's, I think there's different ways to do, you know, religion. I think you look at a guy like Tim Tebow. That's not how I'm personally made. Mm-hmm. Um, you got a problem with Tim Tebow or no, you just, you're, diff- you're different than him? Yeah. I think what he does is amazing. Yep. And I think it's outstanding what Tim, a guy like Tim Tebow does. I'm not built like that. That's just not my personality. So I go about things a little bit differently. And I think. You know, I talk to guys on the Bills that are very similar to me in that way. And I think that there's ways that we reach guys that guys like Tim Tebow couldn't reach. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's, you know, there's different ways to do it. And I'm not saying one way is right or wrong. I just think it's different, just like anything else. That's good stuff. I just, I, I like listening to it. And just, you know, the thing that keeps going through my mind is no matter who they are, no matter where they came from, no matter what they believe, they're still people made in God's image. And that's what sometimes we lose sight of. Like, and, and when you play football with guys and you go through all that, you actually, no matter how different you are, you start to have a little heart for them. You know, you care about them. And then you want them to know. I mean, I know just as parents watching this unfold and learning about these players and their lives and where they come from, you, you start to care. And, uh, and then when you're in it, you got all the dynamics, you know, which I don't know about, like what effect they have on this and that and the other and how, how the guys handle that together. Let's talk about it, Tim, from your perspective, because you're the, the, the dad of a football player who's a preacher. Like other dads of football players own businesses. Uh, some of them write songs. Right. Some of them do all kinds of different things. But just kind of like you kind of stand out. I mean, I, I, a little bit like when people ask me what I do when I'm sitting on a plane, I'm kind of like, oh, gosh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, can't we just relate as normal people? Because as soon as I tell you <laughs> right. that I that I lead ministries or whatever, then it's going to totally turn this. Yeah. And that's just part of the way it is. Yeah. But what, what, what was the dynamic or what has been the dynamic for you as the parent of, of Ike, who's the preacher and, the, yeah. and, the, and the, the dad of the guy who kind of maybe toes the line a little bit better than some of the other guys or whatever? Yeah. Um. I mean, that's a good question. I, I, I don't really think about it so much. I think more in terms of when I'm hanging around, you know, getting to know other parents, meeting players, what what can I bring to the table to help? You know, God God's opened up this door for Ike. It's also a doorway for us. We've met so many people. We've enjoyed it. We've been able to be an encouragement to a lot of people. And then, you know, then out of that comes opportunities to invest in their lives. We just got done fishing with some of the former players and had great conversations with them. And I don't wear it on my sleeve that I'm a, a preacher or a pastor or anything like that. And I, I don't bring it up too much unless I'm asked. More than anything, I'm just wondering, in this moment, what can I bring to the table? And that's, that's worked well. And, and then, of course, people find out over time, and I've gotten to lead a chapel there and you know, with the Hawkeyes and do a variety of things over time, but just mostly want them to know that we care. Yeah. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, you guys went fishing with some other football buddies from Iowa uh, down in Florida, mm-hmm. and uh, you came back and you preached at Fresh Wind. In fact, I'll link that message on YouTube in our show notes so people can watch it. It was a great sermon, but you just talked about, you know, you used some uh, stories from your fishing trip to talk about... Um, what a great time that was. Take us into something like that. Like, and I think you kind of just described it a little bit, but you don't go in there guns blazing like, okay, I'm going to make sure that by the end of this trip, I've said the gospel three times and we've had these many devotions, but you're definitely have your antenna up. And, and it was obvious just in the way that you talked in that sermon that you were aware of the role that you could play, even on this little short fishing trip Mm -hmm. in helping shape, because you're out on a boat having conversations about all these things. Uh, how would you, what, what I'm thinking about is people who are hearing this, yeah, who are just given opportunities all the time. Right. 
in the real world. Right. Life is an opportunity. Every That's right. day. So every interaction. Coach right? us on how to do that the right way. Well, to me, you know, I, I go to Romans right now <clears throat> where Paul said, all who are led of the Spirit are the sons and daughters of God. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit leading a life is what we've been describing through this whole podcast. God wants to lead our lives into the opportunities he has for us. And if you're listening and you're learning to tune into the Holy Spirit, every day, every interaction is an opportunity. God is up to something. And one of the things with sports is you got these people who are on TV and they become popular and their names are well known. But when it all strips away, they're just another person like you and me. And they have their life and they're dealing with their challenges and they're facing hard things, and they need a place where they can talk about it. They need some, you know, environment where it's safe to do that. And if the guys can do that together, that helps each other. And and if, if you're there and you, you can relate with them as people, they appreciate it, you know. And the parents are the same. The parents are going through all these stresses. I mean, it's so stressful to watch parents you know, of those players and a fan who hasn't had a child involved, they don't get it, you know, and, and they can yell at the TV and they can say things. I mean, we, we hear things in the stands that are crazy and you have to strip all that stuff away and just say, Hey, this is more people trying to do their life, you know, as best they can. And yeah, they've been given these opportunities, but it still doesn't mean they're not having trouble with their girlfriend or trouble with their mom, their dad, or having experienced some real trauma. Yeah. And, How'd you get to Buffalo? Tell that part of the story. <clears throat> so after the injury, kind of knew that I wasn't going to get drafted. So the last day of the draft or so, you start getting calls from teams that are basically trying to recruit you to come be a free agent, an undrafted free agent to your team. And I basically just trusted my agent with everything, uh, with that decision. And he said, you know, good opportunity out there. So went out there. Uh wasn't 100% really that whole first year, but got through camp. Because of the Achilles injury. Yeah, because yeah. of recovering from the Achilles. So, I mean, so. really, that took more than a year to recover from. I mean, that was <clears throat> at like a year when the season started. Um, and I was, you know, able to do everything, just didn't feel like myself till about a year, I would say. And then uh, made it through camp all the preseason, got released on the, la like the last day of cuts, uh, Kansas City claimed me for 10 days. Then they released me, tried to put me on practice squad. Then Buffalo cla claimed me back to their roster. So basically went from thinking I was going to be on Buffalo's practice squad to Kansas City to Kansas City practice squad, thinking I was going to be on Kansas City's practice squad, to back to Buffalo um, all within like 14 days. So that was kind of a crazy start. Didn't really play much my first year till the end. Uh, played like a hundred snaps and uh, had a lot of fun. I mean, just a lot of fun meeting new guys. And uh, that's, that's probably one of my favorite things about football is you get to meet so many guys from different backgrounds and, and learn a lot of, you know, about where guys come from. I'd say even more in the NFL than at Iowa. Um, but just getting to talk to different guys and being around them in the locker room every day and seeing how they're handling this or that is just is very interesting. And there's things that, you know, I see or hear on a weekly basis that, you know, are just insane. <laughs> um, but it's, you know, it's a lot of fun. And, I you know, going to work every day is an interesting time. It's, it's a stressful job. Uh, you never know when your last day could be. Uh, whether you're going to get cut or get hurt or whatever it is, but just going in every day with an open mind and trying to learn as much as you can from older guys. You know, that, that kind of stuff doesn't really change from college. But, uh, you know, the culture thing is different, uh, I would say, in the NFL because guys are definitely more on their own. Uh, everybody's kind of the, running their own business with yeah. their own, you know, with their self. In college, it's like more of everybody's kind of doing everything together. Um, you're going to class still, you know, you're doing this, that nobody's got a family really. Yep. So, you know, it, you can kind of live your own life and then just connect with guys when you're at work. You know, there's not a lot of 
outside of football hanging out. It's guys that are going home and hang out with their wife and kids or, you know, get, taking care of their body. So that part of it's different. Um, I, I kind of really enjoy that part of it. Um, I just like, you know, handling my own business and not really having to worry about anybody else. Yeah. Uh, one thing I remember you telling me is just like w- when you're an offensive lineman, it's like no one really cares about you that much because it's like everyone knows the quarterback, the receivers, these D-backs. You guys are kind of like the unsung, you know, un- unknown uh, guys. And and you kind of enjoy being able to blend in a little bit that way. Yeah, absolutely. Although I mean, it's tough to blend in at 326.5 yeah. walking around town. <laughs> it's tougher back here. Uh, yeah. But, no, I, I really I enjoy being – you know, I've gone from quarterback in high school to, like, there everybody's – knows who the quarterback is to an old lineman you know you could have somebody say they're the biggest bills fan of all time and there's probably a very small chance they know who the heck i am so That's it's awesome. like you know i kind of like that part of it you get a little you know anonymity i was out in buffalo on my way to a meeting up in uh, toronto and i went to the car rental place and these guys you guys were having a great season this is just this last fall and i mean these people are all in uh, I listened to your podcast with the Wash Up Walk Ons, and they were talking about Bills fans. Um, two stories I want you to tell. One is how how was it that you first showed up on everyone's radar screen? Like everyone got excited about you after a certain play. Okay, uh, you remember the? Uh, yeah, the, my first year. Yeah, <clears throat> uh, a guy took a cheap shot on our quarterback, and uh, I just wasn't really having it. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Just started a pretty big, big fight, and thankfully I didn't get fined for it. So <laughs> maybe and, we'll put that clip on the podcast show notes. <laughs> I, I uh, just kind of you went late on the guy. I mean, you didn't fight him. You just kind of held him to the ground. Yeah, we'll call it that. And people, <laughs> and he people loved. In, it. Yeah, he came in and did a shot on the quarterback. This guy, and he's kind of known for it. And Ike just came in pretty hard on him. And then I don't know if it was your bench came. Or their bench, or who knows, but it turned You told out. me after that, though, all the fans are like, all of a sudden you're getting tweeted and hashtagged and everything else because you're protecting the quarterback. Yeah. So these Bills fans, they're a blue-collar group of people. Mm-hmm. And they're really – I had no idea how in into football the Bills are. Uh, one thing that's also interesting to me is, is the Buffalo Bills are the only NFL team in the state of New York. Yes. Which yeah. is a, a source of pride for them. And they're a little bit got a chip on their shoulder about the Jets and the Giants, which play in New Jersey. Yeah. And so very blue collar, very proud of their team, nuts at games and tailgating. What's this jumping off things onto tables? Just, that's, that's like a thing, thing that they do. Yeah, on and, the tables. And so you're telling me like Menards runs out of tables because people buy tables just to take them to tailgates and jump through them. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's I've I've never got to you know witness tailgating obviously, but it's <laughs> uh they start Friday night, Saturday they're rolling and they roll all, all the way through the game and after the game. So they you know the fans there are just unbelievable. Mm-hmm. They're diehard, awesome. We'll show up. If you win every game or lose every game, the stadium's, you know, almost full every week, no matter what. I mean, which is, you know, what you're describing here. For some people, it's a religion. You know, I mean, it's their it's their gathering point. It's their ceremony. It's their religion. And uh, our culture has that. I mean, sports can become an idol for people. And, and uh, it's not very good at saving souls. It can help form a soul and shape a soul and bring some souls out of some hard things. But... <laughs> It being that being said, it's great entertainment. You know, I mean, it's fun. It's it's fun to watch. Tony Bennett, and I want to come to this, and this is a good place to go, and maybe a good place to end. I'm going to say this, give you a couple chance to say whatever else you want to say in response to this or anything else, and then we'll shut her down. Tony Bennett was the head coach of is the head coach of Virginia's basketball team. You know about him, yeah. And uh, so two years ago, they were the first one seed to be knocked out of the tournament by a 16 seed never happened. I mean, one of the most embarrassing moments you can imagine as a basketball team or coach. A year later, last year, they fight all the way back and they win the national championship. And after the game, during his press conference, Tony Bennett, who's a believer and pretty outspoken about his faith in Christ, uh, he said, you know, my dad had a great quote, and his dad, Dick Bennett, was also a basketball coach and a Christian. His dad had a great quote that he kind of passed on to me, and I've made it my own. And the quote is this. He said, uh, because I know what truly matters, 
it enables me to enjoy what seems to matter like this. I thought that was so good. And that's kind of what you're talking about, Mm -hmm. Tim. Like some people, the world places a whole lot more value on football or sports Mm -hmm. or the Bills or the Hawkeyes uh, than was ever intended. It wasn't supposed to be that big of a deal. But for those of us who know Christ and who know what truly matters, it doesn't mean that we need to not enjoy those things. It just means we need to enjoy those things with the right perspective. Um, so because I know what truly matters, it enables me to enjoy what seems to matter like this. Yeah, and you really can enjoy it. I mean, it's been a lot of fun. I hope so. I've loved yeah. it my whole yeah. life. <laughs> and, and what you're saying, I would just, you know, our, our, <clears throat> our country, the world right now is facing this issue of this virus, right? And we're, what, what will we shut down the... NBA, they're suspended. You know, some of these things that life and death matters more. Right. And and I would say even more than life or death, our faith is more precious than that. And that's and, and that's what I appreciate about you having us on here, you know, and the opportunity to share that this is really about a faith journey and God has used sports in Ike's life a lot and and uh, we're thankful for that, and it's given a platform to share a lot of things about the uniqueness of how God makes people and an opportunity to share about his love with people and uh, gives you a little platform to do that. Yeah. Ike, when it's all said and done, football's going to end someday. Uh, how do you want to be remembered, not just in football but in life, for having used the platform God gave you for the sake of Christ? Um. I'd say my biggest goal would be something that we kind of talked about with the uh, how to toe that line um, between being, you know, a strong Christian guy and a guy that can relate and hang out with those guys that are doing other stuff. Um, I definitely haven't done it perfect. I've done things that I, you know, wish I wouldn't have done one way, but I, I've never gone so far the other way that I've turned people off to God, I don't feel like because of how I've acted towards them, like being super religious and really putting them down, um, which I think that turns certain guys off. I don't think I've ever done that to anybody. And I'm always working to be more outspoken because that's probably the biggest challenge for being more outspoken when maybe I'm not super comfortable in that situation. Um, You know, like I said, being more of like a Tim Tebow type of guy, even though that goes against my, uh, you know, how, how my attitude and how you're wired how i'm wired yeah so i would say just just being known as that guy um that could connect to guys no matter where they're at in their life and just being like somebody that they could text or or call and i have guys that do that text or call me and just be like asking me questions about certain things or how they should handle certain things like that that would be i mean way more to me than you know anything i could ever do in in sports awesome I hope that people who listen to this, um, not many of them are going to be NFL players. If any of you are, if any of your former Hawkeye players, thank you. You've given me great enjoyment over the years, and <clears throat> I love all of you. Um, but every one of us can identify with uh, God's put us in the world, and he's called us to be salt and light, and he gives us opportunities every day. And we're all kind of struggling to figure out what to do with those opportunities and to be more effective with them. Tim, I'm kind of springing this on you, but uh, would you mind praying at the end of this? Oh, that'd be great. Pray for Ike. I I want you to pray for Ike and his platform, and I'll just sit here and listen. Yeah, yeah, and I I would just add right before I pray is, you know, what Ike's saying there is is really how Christ lived. I mean, he hung out with, he was hardest on the overly religious people, and he hung out with people who were really struggling with their journey and, you know, doing things that probably weren't right. And he cared about him, and he loved him, and that's what I'm. I've enjoyed seeing Ike bridge those gaps in a lot of ways. So, thank you, Matt. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the chance just to talk about these things again, and and thank you for the way you work in our lives and the way you direct us. How uniquely made each one of us is, and think of those that'll be listening to this. I just pray for them right now that you would touch their hearts, give them courage where they need boldness and courage, give them patience and sensitivity, 
help us, even as Ike is describing, to not have a judgmental ad- attitude as we approach the world, but an attitude that cares and wants to encourage and help people find their best life, really, the life you've created them for. And help us use the platforms that we have. And as Ike continues, in, you know, he and Katie have this baby coming soon and they start this family and then they go into this next season. I just pray that you help them navigate the opportunities you've given them well and then the platform that they have, help them use it to glorify you and expand your kingdom well. And we just pray that you would accomplish this uh, through each of us as well. Help us be available to what you have for us each day. We pray it in Christ's name. Amen. The CC Podcast is part of Christian Crusaders Radio and Internet Ministry, started in 1936 and is one of America's longest-running radio ministries. We are 100% donor-funded, and donations to our ministry are 100% tax-deductible. So if you are encouraged, challenged, or inspired by today's conversation, please consider making a donation on our website, christiancrusaders.org, or mail a check to Christian Crusaders, 7401 University Avenue, Cedar Falls, Iowa, 50613. In addition to our other podcasts, which I mentioned at the front of this episode, I want to mention two of our other ministry partners worth checking out. First, the Cedar Falls Bible Conference, equipping believers with the truth of God's word since 1922. Visit cedarfallsbibleconference.com for free access to previous conference content or for more information about upcoming events. Second is Power to Change Digital Strategies, an online ministry partnering volunteer Christian mentors with people around the world searching the internet for answers. If you or someone you know could benefit from an anonymous online conversation with a caring Christian adult, go to issuesiface.com. Or if you would like to be a volunteer Christian mentor, please visit p2cdigital.com. That's the letter P, the number two, and the letter C, digital.com. See our episode notes for details and links. And remember to subscribe, leave a five-star rating, and write a review. God's richest blessings to you. And thanks again for listening.